God's helpline. What are some of the characteristics of God's elect? Personal traits. Think about that. That's what I want you to think about. You want the positive or the negative first? I'll give you the positive first, okay? Positively, I think overwhelmingly we are can do, get it done, no matter what it costs, no matter what it takes, servants of the Lord. On the negative side, we all are extremely impatient. <laughs> Have you noticed that about God's election? I think that's because we want to get it done for the Lord right now. <laughs> I mean right now. We need to all relax and, and learn to be a little bit more patient. You know why? Because things are going to happen on God's time frame, not ours. You know, we, we think we're pretty important people sometimes, but believe it or not, God really doesn't care about our time frame. He's got a time frame. He has a plan. And that's what we need to learn to attune ourselves to. Okay, so when are we supposed to be can do, get it done for the Lord types? And when are we supposed to turn it over to the Lord? Where's that line? And you know what? Sometimes it's difficult to determine that line. But what I want you to leave here this afternoon with is the, I mean, planted in your mind that there is a time to turn it over to the Lord, and you must be able to recognize that and see it crystal clear. That's what I'm going to ask you to leave here today with. So, you know, being can do, get it done for the Lord types, it's natural that we want to do everything that we possibly can by ourselves for the Lord. But there is a time to turn it over to Him. Let's begin our study with one of the most... No, one of the best examples of a can-do type, get it done for the Lord, found in the Bible. His name was Elijah. But you know what? Even Elijah, and I'll ask you to open your Bibles to 1 Kings chapter 18. We're going to start here in a minute at verse 30. 1 Kings 18, 30. But even Elijah had moments of weakness and doubt as to his abilities. And you know what? We have weaknesses, and we have moments of doubt. And that's when we should turn it over to the Lord. And that's what this message is about today, God's helpline. You know, Elijah was sent by the Lord to the ten tribes to the north, Israel. And he went to King Ahab, and he said, Thus saith the Lord, It shall not rain, I mean not even one drop of dew, until my mouth says so. And of course, what does it come out of his mouth? The word of the Lord, for sure. Elijah was, I mean, he was can do. He was rocking and a rolling. I mean, God told him, you go out to Kirith, and the ravens will come and feed you. Did Elijah question that? Not one time. I mean, he went. And when the brook Kirith dried up, the Lord said, you go to Zidon, and the widow will feed you. Remember, she had one handful of meal left in that barrel that lasted over a year. And a little bit of oil in that flask lasted over a year. Elijah didn't say, oh, Lord, are you sure you want me to do that? There was not one bit of doubt in his mind. He did exactly as the Lord said. We're going to pick it up with Elijah being can do and get it done for the Lord. 1 Kings chapter 18, verse 30, and it reads... And Elijah said unto all the people, Come near unto me. And all the people came near unto him. And he repaired the altar of the Lord that was broken down. Now Ahab had invited, I mean, the princes of Israel, the ten tribes, the heads of the families. We've got everybody that's anybody witnessing this. Remember, this is where just after the 450 Baal prophets were slashing themselves up and jumping up and down before their altar of Baal, went in until the evening sacrifice was due. Do you think there was any fire came down from heaven for their altar? No, there wasn't, but Elijah's getting ready to get it done. He's saying, come here. I want you all to witness the power of God. 31. And Elijah took 12 stones according to the number of the tribes of the sons of Jacob, unto whom the word of the Lord came, saying, Israel shall be thy name. 32. 
And with the stones he built an altar in the name of the Lord. And he made a trench about the altar as great as would contain two measures of seed. We're talking three feet wide all the way around this altar. 32. And with the stones he built an altar. And in the name of the Lord we got that. 33. And he put the wood in order. And cut the bullock in pieces. And laid him on the wood. Preparing the sacrifice. And said, fill four barrels with water. And pour it on the burnt sacrifice. And on the wood. Now, water at this time, I mean, it's been three and a half years without so much as even a drop of dew. And think of this spiritually, too. What is our water? The living water. The water there was a spiritual famine in the land at this time. They had all turned to Baal worship. Also, there was a real bad problem with having enough water for everybody to drink. The Lord's, I think, telling us here, the drought is about to be over. 34. And he said, do it the second time. And they did it the second time. And he said, do it the third time. And they did it the third time. Twelve barrels of water in all. How many stones did we have? We had twelve stones. That's one for each tribe of Israel, is it not? We had twelve barrels of water. That's one for each tribe of Israel, is it not? The shortage is about to be over. And the water ran round about the altar, and he filled the trench also with water. And it came to pass at the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice that Elijah the prophet came near and said, Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and of Israel, let it be known this day that thou art God in Israel, and that I am thy servant and that I have done all these things at thy word. I didn't make all this stuff up in my head. Like these 450 Baal prophets speaking out of their own hearts. Elijah's saying, it wasn't me that said it's not going to rain. That there's not going to be even a drop of dew for three and a half years. The Lord said it. And I'm just here as his servant. He's a can do. He's a get it done. 37. Hear me, O Lord. Hear me that this people may know that thou art the Lord God and that thou hast turned their heart back again. Turn their heart back again away from idolatry. What does Malachi chapter 4 verses 5 and 6 tell us about Elijah? The Lord promised. He said, I'll send Elijah back in the end times to turn the hearts of the children Back to the fathers. Elijah's doing the same thing here. Back in verse 21, he said, How long are you guys going to have two opinions? How long do you think you can worship Baal and Yahweh? Get off the fence. You can't have it both ways. You worship Yahweh, if you believe he's God. Or you worship Baal, if you think he's God. 38. Then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt sacrifice and the wood and the stones and the dust and licked up the water that was in the trench. I mean, all of it. Think that got some attention? Verse 39. And when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces and they said, The Lord, He is the God. The Lord, He is the God. Twice for emphasis. And Elijah said unto them, Take the prophets of Baal. This word take means seize or apprehend. Let not one of them escape. And they took them, and Elijah brought them down to the brook Kishon and slew them there. And this is an idiom. He actually probably had them slew there. But... Boy, that was awful mean of Elijah, wasn't it? No. That's God's law. Deuteronomy chapter 13, verses 1 through 5. Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 20. The Lord said, Don't tolerate false prophets that turn the hearts of my children away from me and sends them worshiping after false gods. Elijah's taking care of business. 46. And the hand of the Lord was on Elijah. 
and he girded up his loins and ran before Ahab to the entrance of Jezreel. It'd be about 18 miles from Carmel to Jezreel. So, I don't know, unless Elijah was in a whole lot better shape than I am, it was a good thing the hand of the Lord was on him, because 18 miles, that's a long ways in my book to run, especially in front of a chariot. <laughs> but think about this now. God tells Elijah, do it, do this. He does it. God tells Elijah, do that. He does it. He doesn't question. Can do. Get it done for the Lord. Unfortunately, we're going to see, as I mentioned earlier, the weaknesses and some doubt on Elijah's part. Chapter 19, verse 1. And Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done, and with all he had, how he had slain all the prophets of the sword, with the sword. And, I mean, we're talking 450 that sat at her table. I mean, these are Jezebel's prophets. I think she's going to be too very happy with Elijah. Then Jezebel sent a messenger unto Elijah. Remember, he's in Jezreel where she's at. Saying, So let the gods, small g, do to me and more also, if I make not thy life as the life of one of them, of the Baal prophets that are dead, in other words, by tomorrow about this time. May the gods kill me if I don't kill you by this time tomorrow. Let me ask you something. If you were in Elijah's situation right there, what would you do? Is, it, is that line, God's help line, is that something that we might want to think about right here, crossing, instead of trying to do it ourselves? Let's see, verse 2. We got that, verse 3. And when he, this is Elijah, saw that, he arose and went for his life, and came to Beersheba, which belongeth to Judah, and left his servant there. He didn't want his servant to die with him. Now, wait a minute. Where did God send Elijah? To Israel, the ten tribes to the north. Where is he now? He's in Judah. It's kind of hard to prophesy to the ten tribes to the north of Israel when you're in Judah. Beersheba, that's as far as south in the nation of Israel as you could go at this time. And he's not finished heading south at this point. I think Elijah should have had a little more patience here. I think he should have asked the Lord, what do you want me to do? It was time for him to cross God's helpline, to seek some input. Instead, he's tearing off, headed south, on his own. Did God tell him to go to Beersheba? No. And like I said, he's fixing to go further south. Verse 4. But he himself, Elijah, went a day's journey into the wilderness, into the desert of Paran, and came and sat down under a juniper tree. And he requested for himself that he might die, and said, It is enough now, O Lord, take away my life, for I am not better than my father's. You know, Elijah came back from performing wonderful miracles. That fire coming down from heaven and consuming. But he went back and Jezebel threatened him. And he felt like he had failed. He began to question his own abilities to turn the hearts of the children of Israel back to the Father. He's running scared from Jezebel. You know, Moses did about the same thing. Numbers chapter 11. All the people are hollering for flesh. We want meat. Take us back into the land of Egypt. I mean, we had cucumbers and onions and melons there. And all we have out here is this loathsome bread, the manna that God was feeding them with. Moses said, have I begotten all these children, Lord, that I'm supposed to pick them up in my bosom and carry all 2.1 million of them into the promised land? Just kill me now. Even the greatest servants of our father can become despondent. And have moments of weakness like this. And what I want you to do is take a lesson from this. A lesson from Elijah in this case. And that is, when a little bit of trouble comes along, and you don't know what to do, go to your father. Don't take off on your own agenda. 
He's, what did Christ say? Christ said, Behold, I have told you all things. Everything we need to know is right here in this Word. But if you get to a point in your life, and when I said, you know, when we come across a little bit of trouble, beloved, there is some trouble on the horizon. It's called the day of Jacob's trouble. I'm talking about the tribulation. And you better have your heads screwed on straight. And if you ever have a question, ask God. Don't just take off on your own. Don't be afraid to cross God's helpline. Verse 5. And as he lay and slept under a juniper tree, behold, then an angel, this is the angel of the Lord, we'll see in verse 7, that's the Lord himself, touched him and said unto him, Arise and eat the third miraculous feeding of Elijah. First, the, the ravens by Brook Kirith, the widow at Zidon, and now the Lord himself. God takes care of his own. It never ceases to amaze me. We get questions at the chapel so often in the broadcast. Of, well, I don't have a lot of money saved up. You know, how am I going to take care of my electric bill when Antichrist returns? Think about this. God taking care of this servant of his, feeding him by the ravens. Do you think he's not going to take care of his elect when the tribulation is going on? Of course he is. He has work for you to do. God's not going to take Elijah's life here. Why? He has work that he wants Elijah still to do. And we'll see this. He's going to get his attention. Verse 6. And he looked, and behold, there was a cake baking on the coals. Think manna, maybe? And a cruise of water at his head. And he did eat and drink and laid him down again. Now note the angel of the Lord, which is a manifestation of the Lord where man can see him, hasn't told Elijah to go anywhere at this point, has he? Elijah sure isn't asking either. He's on the run from Jezebel. And the angel of the Lord came again the second time and touched him and said, Arise and eat, because the journey is too great for thee. Does this indicate to you that the Lord knew where he was going? He knew how far it was. The journey's too great for you not to eat. You're going to run out of energy. Verse 8. And he arose and did eat and drink, and went in the strength of the meat, or the food, forty days and forty nights unto Horeb, the mount of God, the same as Sinai. Now, it wouldn't have taken him forty days and forty nights to go approximately 180 miles. It just wouldn't have taken that long. I think, well, well it's forty Probation, right? I think God's put Elijah on a little bit of probation here. He's wanting him to get his head screwed on straight because he has work that he still wants him to do. But he's letting him go on off. I think Elijah probably is going to Sinai hoping that just as the Lord manifested himself to Moses on Sinai, that the Lord would manifest himself to him. The Lord's already manifested himself through his appearance as the angel of the Lord. Verse 9, And he came thither unto a cave, maybe the same cave that Moses backed into, the cliff of the rock, you remember, as the Lord passed by, and lodged there. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, and he said unto him, What dost thou hear, Elijah? That's a question I want all of you to ask yourselves. And I'm not, I, I don't think the Lord here, yes, he's talking about location. What are you doing in this location? This is not where I told you to go. But also, I think the Lord is saying, what are you doing here? And that's the question I want you all to ask yourselves. What am I doing here? Am I concerned about the Lord's will and his plan? And what I should be doing to help that plan along? Or am I more concerned about my will? What I want to do? Think about it. God's will or your own will? It's kind of a wake-up call to Elijah. Verse 10. And he said, I have been very jealous. This word means zealous. For the Lord God of hosts. 
For the children of Israel have forsaken thy covenant, thrown down thine altars, and slain thy prophets with the sword. Most of you know that a direct quote in Romans chapter 11, verses 2 and 3. And I, even I only, he's emphasizing here, am left, and they seek my life to take it away. He's feeling pretty poor me, baby, right here, is he not? I'm the only one left. Well, there's 7,000, and we'll see when we get to verse 18, symbolic of God's elect, that we're still with him. But notice, Elijah didn't say... He, he kind of stuck up for himself there. I've been zealous for you, Father. I mean, I've been getting it done. I've been can do for you, Father. He didn't say anything about that he was running for his life from Jezebel and threw a little fit back in verse 4 and threw himself down on the ground and said, Just take me now, Father. Verse 11. And he said, Go forth, stand up upon the mount before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by. And a great and strong wind rent the mountains and break in pieces the rocks before the Lord. That's a mighty strong wind, friends. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. I think Elijah wanted God to just destroy. Wipe out Israel. I'm the only one left that hasn't thrown down your altars and slain your prophets. Wipe them out. They're no good. God's showing here, I could do that if that was my will. I could have a wind come along and totally wipe out Israel. I could have an earthquake wipe them out. But guess what? That wasn't God's will. That was Elijah's will. Let's realize the difference between the Lord's will and our own will. Verse 12. And after the earthquake... A fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. All these, the wind, the earthquake, and the fire, uh, things thought of as God's wrath and and justice, if you will, judgment, better said, passed. And after the fire, a still, small voice. The sound of stillness, if you will. The Septuagint reads here, a gentle breeze. Yahweh is in the gentle breeze. That's what he's trying to get across to Elijah here is, that's not my will to destroy Israel right now. I'm I'm merciful. I'm long-suffering. I'm gracious toward my children. And it was so when Elijah heard it that he wrapped his face in his mantle, just as Moses had done in Exodus chapter 3, and went out and stood in the entering in of the cave. And behold, there came a voice unto him and said, What dost thou hear, Elijah? What are you doing here, Elijah? You're not doing what I asked you to do. And beloved, I hope that the Lord never has to come to any of you in the day of Jacob's trouble and ask you, what are you doing here? I gave you my plan. Why didn't you take time to read it? I know his elect won't say that, but I think if he has to go get one of his elect, if one of us takes off on our own agenda, off to Beersheba, because we're afraid of the Antichrist, just as Elijah was afraid of Jezebel, God's going to send somebody after you. It may not be himself, but he's going to come up to you and he's going to say, what what are you doing? Don't you remember? You have a destiny. I've got things I need you to do. Verse 14. And he said, I have been very jealous for the Lord God of hosts. He's going to give him the same answer he did the first time. Because the children of Israel have forsaken thy covenant, thrown down thine altars, and slain thy prophets with the sword. And I, even I only, am left. (laughs) Poor Elijah. And they seek my life to take it away. He didn't ask God, what should I do at Jezreel? I guess that's the whole point I'm trying to, to make out of this is if, he'd, if we'd back all the way up to where he came down, you remember, with Ahab and it was raining like all get out, broke that drought of three and a half years, and Jezebel threatened his life, right then, if he would have stopped and asked the Lord, what do you want me to do? 
Do you think the Lord would have told him? Yeah, he should have crossed that God's helpline. Verse 15. And the Lord said unto him, Go return on thy way. In other words, return to the way that I told you to go that you have deviated from. To the wilderness of Damascus, this being in Syria. And will thou, when thou comest, anoint Hazael to be king over Syria. You think our God is not a God that controls all nations? He even decides who the king of Syria is going to be. A heathen nation. And Jehu, the son of Nimshi, shalt thou anoint to be king over Israel. That means Ahab and Jezebel are out. And Elisha, the son of Shaphat, of Abel Mihola, shalt thou anoint to be prophet in thy room. That prophet that Elijah will eventually walk by and throw his mantle on him. In other words, that's symbolic of saying, you're taking my place. And you remember in, in 2 Kings chapter 1, Elisha would ask for a double portion of that spirit. And sure enough, of course, Elijah said, I, that's not mine to give, but if you see me go up in the whirlwind, it's yours, the double portion. And of course, Elisha would perform twice as many miracles as Elijah, or the Lord would through him, I better said probably. Verse 18. Or did we give 17? No. And it shall come to pass that him that escapeth the sword of Haziel shall Jehu slay, and him that escapeth from the sword of Jehu shall Elisha slay. What this is saying is, yeah, there's going to be some chastisement of Israel, all right. They're not getting off scot-free. Verse 18. Yet, the Lord speaking, I have left me 7,000 in Israel, all the knees which have not bowed unto Baal, and every mouth which hath not kissed him. You're going to be part of that group, beloved. You're not going to bow a knee to him. You're not going to kiss him. Why? Because you know where God's helpline is. And you're not going to be like Elijah and take off on your own. You're going to follow God's plan and his instructions. Nothing wrong with being can do and get it done. Don't take me wrong. Yes, we have work to do. But there comes a time when it's critical that you turn it over to the Lord. Let's go to another example in uh, the New Testament. Another can do, get it done. Turn with me to Acts chapter 21, verse 8. <clears throat> now, Paul was downright zealous. I mean, you remember before he was struck down on the road to Damascus? Paul was a zealous killing Christians and putting them in prison, dragging them out of their homes, dragging them out of their churches, as he was for the Lord after he was struck down. It'd be hard to find somebody that's more can do, get it done than Paul. Acts chapter 21, verse 8. And the next day we that were of Paul's company departed. Now Luke would even be in this company. And came into Caesarea, this being 60 miles from Tyre, uh, by the coast road. And we entered into the house of Philip, the evangelist. This simply means he's a preacher of the gospel. Which was one of the seven and abode with him. Now, one of the seven, what are we talking about here? Back in Acts chapter 6, verse 5, the twelve apostles... I mean, the church was growing so fast that they were becoming stretched thin. They needed some help. So they found 12 righteous men. Philip was one of those seven. There was another man that was among that seven. His name was Stephen. You know what they did to Stephen? They stoned him to death. Do you know who was there holding the coats while they stoned Stephen to death? Before he was struck down on the road to Damascus, his name was Saul, or Paul. I wonder how Philip felt about Paul coming into his house when one of the seven that he had been selected with, Paul was there holding their coats. Verse 9, And the same man, this is Philip, 
had four daughters, virgins, which did prophesy. Don't ever let anyone tell you that the Lord does not allow women to teach. What does this say? He had four daughters, which did prophesy. What does that mean? That means that they were evangelists too. They preached the gospel. Acts chapter 2, the words of Joel the prophet. I will pour out my spirit, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Don't ever forget this scripture. If someone tries to tell you women should not be allowed to speak in church. Verse 10. And as we tarried there many days, there came down from Judea a certain prophet named Agabus. He came down because it was about 2,000 feet lower in sea level than the country of the hills of Judea were. This Agabus, by the way, he prophesied the famine of uh, Claudius Caesar's day, this being recorded in Acts chapter 11, 28. He's got a little prophecy for Paul as well. And when he was coming to us, he took Paul's girdle and bound his own hands and feet and said, Thus saith the Holy Spirit, so shall the Jews at Jerusalem, he's being the people of Judah, bind the man that owneth this girdle and shall deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. What is your girt of your gospel armor? Ephesians chapter 6, the word of God. Paul was bound, all right. He was bound to the word of God. He was bound to the name of Jesus Christ. Can do, get it done. Verse 12. And when we heard these things, when we heard they were going to put him in prison and bind him, both we and they that of that place, in other words, the believers, besought him not to go up to Jerusalem. One problem with that. God had told him to go to Jerusalem. That was God's will. Paul was more concerned about accomplishing God's will than his own will. His answer to them... Then Paul answered, What mean ye to weep and to break mine heart? For I am ready not to be bound only, but also to die at Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. That's pretty can-do, folks. That's pretty get-it-done for the Lord, is it not? Are you willing to do the same thing for the name of Jesus Christ? If Antichrist gets in your face and says, Boo! Are you going to take off for Beersheba and part south? I know you won't. Verse 14. And when he would not be persuaded, we ceased, saying, The will of the Lord be done. So be it. And that's what's important, beloved. The will of the Lord be done. Our will really doesn't amount to a hill of beans. It's God's will that is important. Paul, the, by the way, the prophecy of Agabus would come to pass. Be turning to 2 Corinthians chapter 11, if you would, please. The prophecy of Agabus would come to pass. In fact, Paul's willingness to die for the name of the Jesus Christ would be tested on more than one occasion. Most of you are familiar with the first part of this chapter in particular. You'll remember that's where Paul is saying, I'm jealous for you. I, I want to present you as chaste virgins to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And then in verse 3, he goes on to say, I fear lest by any means as the serpent beguiled Eve. You know that word, Greek word is expatio, holy seduced Eve. Through his subtly, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity of that is in Christ. Then all of a sudden we got these false apostles start coming into the picture in this chapter. And they transform themselves into apostles of Christ. But that should be no wonder because Satan himself will transform himself into the angel of light or prince of light. Paul tells them, he says, you're letting these fools come into your church and deceive you. 
And suffer me a little bit here. I'm going to boast Paul's words. I'm going to glory in myself a little bit to try and get your attention and get you to listen. There is a simplicity of Christ. Stop listening to these fools. They're taking you away from the Lord. Let's pick it up. 2 Corinthians 11, verse 21. Paul speaking. I speak as concerning reproach. This meaning shame or dishonor. As though we had been weak. Howbeit, wherein soever any is bold, I speak foolishly, I am bold also. Now, Paul could be bold, I'm going to tell you. And I'll tell you what, it wasn't very popular in this time to be bold. And Paul paid a heavy price for it, as we're about to see. But he was can do, get it done. But he also knew where God's helpline is, as we're going to see. 22. Are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they the seed of Abraham? So am I. He's saying, these fools that you're letting in aren't one bit better than I am. But I'm going to tell you the truth here. Verse 23. Are they ministers of Christ? They say they're ministers of Christ. I speak as a fool. I am more. In labors, more abundant. In stripes, above measure. In prisons, more frequent. In deaths, Oft, Very dangerous to be a Christian at this time. Fall face death on many occasions. Boldly. Verse 24. Of the Jews, or Judeans, five times received I forty stripes, save one. This is the law also. Deuteronomy chapter 25, verse 3. God instructs that if you are going to uh, scourge a man with a whip... 39 stripes is the maximum. And it's believed that they had a whip that had 13 strands on it. And when the whippings occurred, it would be three strokes with the 13 strands. Five times he was scourged with 39 stripes. How many total stripes is that? That's 195 stripes. On Paul's back. I'm not talking about little red marks, folks. I'm talking about permanent scars for life. Paul's back looked like a jigsaw puzzle, I'll assure you. 25. Thrice was I beaten with rods. Once was I stoned. That's recorded that it occurred at Lystra in Acts chapter 14, verse 19. Thrice I suffered shipwreck. A night and a day I have been in the deep. 24 hours after a shipwreck, I was out there hanging on to a floating beam. In journeyings, often, in perils or dangers of waters, this would be probably better floods, you know, we're in danger of a flood ourselves. Revelation chapter 12, verse 15, the floods that will spew out of that dragon's mouth. In perils or dangers of robbers, in perils by mine own countrymen, my own people. In perils by the heathen, people of other nations. In perils in the city. In perils in the wilderness. In perils in the sea. In perils among false brethren. Paul's saying, you name it, I've been there. I, he, he didn't believe anybody could top him as far as being persecuted and punished for the name of Jesus Christ. And I don't know about you, but I sure wouldn't want to change places with Paul, would you? Paul saw trouble with a capital T in weariness and painfulness in watchings this means sleepliness sleeplessness often in hunger and thirst in fastings often in cold and nakedness verse 28 beside or apart from these these th those things that are without that which cometh upon me daily the care of all the churches. This cometh upon me daily. You could think of it as to crowd upon me. Check it out in your strongs and you'll see that that bears out. In other words, the daily crowd of matters besides all these other things. I mean, and who do we have to thank for the epistle we're reading right now? And about half the rest of the New Testament. It was Paul. His, his epistles to the churches. And no doubt he had other responsibilities in the regard to the church as well can do, get it done. Who is weak, and I am not weak? Who is offended, and I burn not? 
If I must needs glory, I will glory or boast of the things which concern my infirmities, my weaknesses. I want you to hang on to that, and we're going to find out why here in a minute. The God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which is blessed for everyone, knoweth that I lie not. In other words, God is my witness. In Damascus, the governor under Aretas, the king kept the city of the Damascenes with a garrison desirous to apprehend me. He had the whole army after me. And through a window in a basket was I let down by the wall and escaped his hands. So far, so good. Everybody agree? Paul's can do, get it done. I mean, I don't think you could choose anyone that's done, done more. But he knows, I'm going to show you, he knows when to cross God's helpline. Verse 12, chapter 12, I should say, verse 1. It is not expedient for me, doubtless, to glory or boast in myself. I will come to visions and revelations of the Lord. I knew a man in Christ above 14 years ago. Some scholars believe this happened in Lystra at the time he was stoned. They almost killed him. Whether in the body, I cannot tell. Or whether out of the body, I cannot tell. In other words, I don't know whether I was in my body or if I was having an out-of-body experience. And Paul's speaking of himself, by the way, here. He's very humble. He's speaking of himself in the third person. God knoweth such an one caught up to the third heaven. Now, a lot of people read this. We have questions quite often. Where is the third heaven? It's not where is the third heaven. It's when is the third heaven. There are three earth ages. There are three heaven ages. There aren't three different worlds and three different heavens. And I knew such a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I cannot tell, God knoweth, twice for emphasis. How that he was caught up into paradise and heard unspeakable words, which it is, is not lawful for a man to utter. This word lawful, actually better translated, possible. They were just too wonderful, too perfect, the words were. Of, or on behalf... Such in one will I glory, yet of myself I will not glory, but in mine infirmities, my weaknesses. And though, or if, I would desire to glory, I shall not be a fool, for I will say the truth. But now I forbear, I hold back, lest any man should think of me above that which he seeth me to be, or that he heareth of me. I'm only a man, he saying. Don't, don't honor me, honor God. And lest I should be exalted above measure, get on an ego trip, through the abundance of the revelations there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. And most would agree and believe that this was Paul's eyesight. Remember, he had a scribe do most of his work in writings of the epistles. Verse 8, listen up. For this thing I besought the Lord thrice that he might depart from me. I went to the Lord three times and asked him, please give him my eyesight back. And he, this being Christ, said unto me, my grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Let me ask you, do you have any weaknesses? I think we'd all be less than honest if we said we didn't have weaknesses. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. That's God's helpline right there, folks. The power of Christ resting on you. How do, how do we get that? Ten. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses, for Christ's sake. And Lord knows Paul saw them. We just went over some of them. For when I am weak, then am I strong. Paul knew that when he had done all that he could do, that that was the time that you turn it over to the Lord. That's when you become strong is when you're at your weakest. 
and you turn it over to the Father. Paul was can do and get it done for the Lord, but he, he knew when he needed to turn it over to the Lord. You know what, beloved? We're getting it done for the Lord. What do I mean by that? You should see the thousands and thousands and thousands of people that this ministry is reaching. January of this year, we mailed out 47,000 newsletters. Since we started offering the Mark of the Beast CD, two months later, and by the way, that count is people we have heard from in the last six months on that 47,000. This month, we mailed out 64,000 newsletters. From 47,000 to 64,000, two months. Folks, that's people we've heard from. We're, we're reaching untold thousands of people that we don't hear from. But I want to tell you something. We all need to know that there comes a time when we can't sit back and say, Whew, Boy, look what we did. We reached all those thousands of people. There's a time to turn it over to the Lord. We could go to several places here. I think most of you probably know what I'm going to hit on right here. It's something you all are very familiar with. We could go to Matthew 10. We could go to Mark 13. Let's go to Luke 21. Won't be here but just for a second, though. There's something stated here in Luke 21 that you won't find in Mark 13, and I think it's important. And I think it's important that we refresh our memories occasionally. On the most, and to me, this is the most important thing in God's Word as far as God's elect are concerned. It's instructions of what you're supposed to do when you're delivered up. You better have that firmly planted. I mean, I don't want you to be like Elijah when he was in Beersheba and Jezebel threatened his life and he takes off in the other direction of the way God told him to go. You know where God's health helpline is. Luke twenty one twelve, Christ speaking. But before all these, they shall lay their hands on you. It isn't going to be for anointing with oil. And persecute you, delivering you up to the synagogues. We're talking the synagogues of Satan, Revelation chapter 2, 9 and 3, 9. And into prisons, being brought before kings and rulers for my name's sake. Not for failure to pay taxes. Not for breaking other laws. For his name's sake. Paul was willing to die for that. Are you? 13. And it, this is he, shall turn to you for a testimony. This is your purpose. This is your moment. This is your destiny if you are one of God's elect. This testimony. Words of Christ. Settle it, therefore, in your hearts. You get this in your minds, and you get it real good. Not to meditate before what ye shall answer. Why is that? In that moment, the Holy Spirit will give you what you are to say. And, beloved, not to cross God's helpline right then is to commit the unforgivable sin. I sure don't want it to where the Lord is sending an angel out to find you and say, What are you doing here? I told you in my word, this is how it's going to happen. This is exactly how it's going to happen. What are you doing over here? I don't want that to happen to any of you. Verse 15. For I will give you a mouth and wisdom which all your adversaries... Who is your main adversary? Satan. Shall not be able to gainsay. That means to deny nor resist. That's the reason that you have to turn it over to God. You can't say things that will accomplish that. We're weak at times. We have doubts at times. It's okay to be can do and get it done, but you turn it over to the Father at this point.
you wait for that Holy Spirit to give you what to say. And I, I, I'll guarantee you, I, I would I'd bet a nickel to a donut that there's not one of us that hasn't in some way thought about, boy, would I like to show Satan what I think of him. <laughs> Look what he's doing to our brothers and sisters. If I had the chance, I'd tell... Careful, careful, careful. Sixteen. And ye shall be betrayed, both by parents and brethren and kinsfolks and friends. And some of you shall they cause to be put to death. Who's, who's death? Satan. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14. The reason Jesus Christ came to this earth in the flesh, to destroy him that had the power over death, that is to say, the devil. I think this is what Christ meant in Matthew chapter 10, verse 37, where he said, You have to love me more than your mother, your father, your sister, your brother. Bad translation in Luke where it says you must hate your mother or father. But the correct translation there in Matthew. You better love him more. And he shall be hated for all men for my name's sake. But there shall not an hair on your head perish. That's a promise. Believe it, beloved. The reason I wanted to come here for this very special verse. In your patience, possess ye your souls. That's directed directly to you, God's elect. You're the ones that are going to be delivered up. In your patience, possess ye your souls. In closing, turn with me to Psalm 37. Most of you know Psalm 37, an acrostic <clears throat> psalm. In the Hebrew language, each, each verse has four lines, except for three verses, which have three lines. Those are verses 7, 20, and 34. And this psalm, most of you know, is, tells us, if, if you ever think that the wicked get ahead, this psalm proves that they don't. So I'm going to pick up the acrostic, and we're just going to do verses 7, 20, and 34, and the remainder of the psalm and will be concluded. Psalm 37, verse 7. Rest in the Lord and wait patiently for Him. In your patience possess ye your souls. Fret not thyself because of him who prospereth in his way. That's his own way or the ways of the world. Because of the man who bringeth wicked devices to pass. Don't worry about it. And people often say, boy, it's just not fair. Did you see old Jack over there? He is the laziest worker in this plant. And he got a promotion last week. Don't worry about it. God keeps very good records. Old Jack is going to get exactly what he has coming to him. And guess what? So are we, each and every one of us. Verse 20, to continue the acrostic. But the wicked shall perish, and the enemies of the Lord shall be as the fat of the lambs. They shall consume, our Father is a consuming fire, into smoke shall they consume away, up in smoke forever and ever. 34, wait on the Lord. Boy, we may learn a little bit about patience here yet today, huh? Wait on the Lord and keep His way. Don't be like Elijah, going the wrong way. I don't want any of you to have the Lord send somebody to you and say, What are you doing here? And he shall exalt thee to inherit the land. That's the Lord will exalt you. When the wicked are cut off, thou shalt see it. You're going to get to witness it yourself. If old Jack deserves it, he's going in the lake of fire. And guess what? You're going to be right there watching it. What about this inheritance? 
for God's elect, Ezekiel chapter 44, where they're called the Zadok. How much of the land are they supposed to receive an inheritance? Not one bit of it. You know why? Because the Lord is their inheritance. What better inheritance? 35. I have seen the wicked in great power and spreading himself like a green bay tree. I've seen that old Antichrist sitting up there acting like he's a cedar of Lebanon. But guess what? He's nothing but an old box cedar. Yet he passed away. And lo, he was not. Yea, I sought him, but he could not be found. Why? Up in smoke. Mark the perfect man. Who's the perfect man? Jesus Christ is the perfect man. And behold, the upright, for the end of that man is peace. You know, you know what it also is? It's a key into the promised land. It's a key into the kingdom, into the eternity. You've got a future. You're not like these others up in smoke. You can have peace now as well. 38. But the transgressors shall be destroyed together. The end of the wicked shall be cut off. Totally different lot for them than the righteous. But the salvation of the righteous is of the Lord, Yahweh. He is their strength in the time of trouble. Remember what we talked about when Elijah had a little bit of trouble? Moses had a little bit of trouble? Beloved, the day of Jacob's trouble approaches. Don't forget where your strength is. Don't forget to cross over God's helpline when you need it. And in verse 40 to conclude, he tells us he will help us. And the Lord shall help them and deliver them. He shall deliver them from the wicked and save them because they trust in him. God's helpline. Yeah, there are times. We have work to do. We, we know that. His word tells us. I need you to help me accomplish this. Those four angels are being held. Why are the four angels that are going to bring out about the end of this dispensation being held? Not all of God's people have been sealed. Guess what we're doing, beloved? We're helping those people seal the word of God in their mind. But... Always remember this, that, that Luke 21. In your patience, don't take off on your own. That's the time to turn it over him to completely. Let's go to his throne. Yahweh, dear Heavenly Father, we do love your written word, Father. We thank you for it. We appreciate the opportunity to serve you, Father. You have in this building today, Father, a group of people that want to serve you, Father. Please reveal more and more of your word to us, Father, so that we can be there for you to accomplish thy will. But let us never, never forget your helpline is always there, Father. And especially that critical moment when we are called up to testify, that testimony that is our destiny. And be with us, Father, always in Yeshua Jesus' precious name. Amen.